Amen. Thank you, Roland. It's really exciting to be with you this evening. I'm um, really looking forward to the series that we're going to be doing, which we've entitled, as Roland said, Relationships for Dummies. And uh, there's a bit of a question mark there because we realize God has already given us a book and we're not all totally struggling in this, but it is something that we like to address in the evening service every sort of 12 to 18 months. We recognize we're constantly working through and, uh, and working out relationships. I sound a little bit like I'm in a cave. If we could solve that, that'd be awesome. But uh, we realize relationships are the kind of thing that we're constantly working through as people. We're constantly wanting to be better. And, uh, and so what we're doing in this series, we're looking at a collection of different types of relationships and how we can live those out in a God-honoring way. And so as you've seen already, we're starting the series this week, and we're starting by looking at uh, community, and particularly Christian community. And uh, I realized actually on Thursday night, we were having a life group. We've been doing this thing in our life group where we've invited people to just share a little bit of their stories. So each person gets sort of 20 minutes to half an hour, and they share a little bit of their story of how they've grown up, what was normal for them, where they came from. It's been really interesting. We've had people from kind of all different walks of life sharing and, and different uh, backgrounds. It's been really interesting. And I, it was my turn to share on Thursday night. So I was beginning to share my story. And as I was sharing, I was like, wow, actually, Christian community was really significant for me in my sort of growth and role um, as I grew up. And the, the reason why is I, I, I'm a bit of a misfit. I really have been my whole life. I went to junior school, and uh, I was quite good academically. Um, so I did really well academically. And I was reasonably good at sports, but I was, like, really not that cool or popular so it was a bit of an awkward space, and I didn't really know where I fitted. And I had some friends who were quite cool, and I had some friends who were quite nerdy. And, and we hung out in two different spaces. And some of you have heard me share a little bit about this before. I, mean, I tried to make a strategic move at one point in my junior school career from the nerdy friends to the cool friends so I could be like cool by association. Right? By God's grace, um, that didn't go terribly awfully. Right? It wasn't great. It was a very ungodly thing to do. I really suggest you don't ever do that. <laughs> Right, but God has restored some of that. But that was the wrestle that I went through. And, and then I went to, to high school. And when I went to high school, I went from Bergfleet to Weinberg High. And uh, I, so my friends were going to either Bergfleet or Weinberg, and I had to pick one. So I chose Weinberg largely because they had an astroturf, and I love playing hockey. But also, my slightly cooler friends were going to Weinberg. And so you know, I thought if I could go with them, that would really help my sort of social standing in the community. And, uh, and so I went to Weinberg. And, and the funny thing is... Uh, I had the same problem in Weinberg. I, mean, I had a really great group of friends. And, and let me say that our friends, we had a really solid group. And, and most of my core friends actually came from Scouts. And we had like a small core group of us that went to Scouts every Friday and, and every like other Saturday. And, and every third day of the week, we did a lot of Scouting stuff. Um, but, but some of us were still there at Weinberg. And that became my core group of friends. But for me, it was always a bit interesting because... Even though we were, they were my best friends, in a lot of ways, I was still different. And so I was in a different academic class from most of the guys who were my core friends. And, and typically, I played in a different sports team to most of the guys who were my core friends. And so there was a way in which I was part of the group, but I was still a little bit like a square peg in a round hole. And, but then if I try to be friends with the guys whose class I was in and whose sports teams I were in, you know, we had that in common, but very little else. And I still wasn't cool enough, really, to be in that circle. And so for my whole kind of school career, I, I wrestled in this place of, of not quite fitting in perfectly into community. And then in matric, courtesy of one of my uh, good friends who is still with me today, and uh, I ended up in this church. I used to go to another church for a long time, and I heard about Jesus and never really met him. And then I came here, and I met Jesus for the first time, and I never left. And, uh, and I suddenly found a community where I fitted. And I was suddenly no longer out of place, but suddenly the people that I was with, we all had the same thing in common. And we all had Jesus that united us. And regardless of what sports team you played in and how well you did academically and whether you had 10,000 friends or five or whether you could talk to girls or not, you know, it didn't really matter because we were all here together and we were all looking to grow and to serve Jesus. And for the first time in my life, I found a place where I truly fitted in. And, and it just helped me realize how incredibly important Christian community is. It really, it, it really helped me see that. And, and Jesus said this, and we, we were talking about this as a 6 p.m. team on Tuesday. Jesus said this. He says, basically, who you are together will tell the world if I am really with you or not. Who you are together will tell the world if I am really with you or not. Now, those of you who may have been in church for a little while may think to yourself, that's, 
It seems a bit of a strange verse, Brad. I'm not sure I've read that one before. It's actually my paraphrased version, so if you'll uh, forgive me that. The real version is in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And, and Jesus says this to his disciples. He says to them, I'm going to give you a new commandment, right? That you love one another just as I have loved you. So you also are to love one another. And in this way, all people will know that you are my disciples because of the love that you have for one another. That's what he says to them. I, I want to ask this question, and uh, we're going to have a little bit of participation tonight. Only a little bit, I promise. It's going to be very lax and fun, right? How many of you went to Sunday school? You grew up kind of in a church, and uh, you got dragged along to Sunday school by your folks, right? Keep your hands up, right? How many of you, while you were in Sunday school, remember learning this verse or this truth? Keep your hands up if that was you, right? This is, a, this is a truth we've known for... How many of you remember the song? Right? You remember the song? Right? A new commandment I give unto... We're at a very uh, old school Sunday school. Right? <laughs> I'll be honest, I hated most of it. <laughs> we got to try and pick hymns from a hymnal. And I was always the guy that picked the two-line hymn to try and get it finished as soon as possible. Right? But this is, this is, unfortunately for most of us, even though we know the words of the song, you might know the verse, it's, it's sometimes become a little bit like Christian rhetoric. It's just something that we say, you know, we love one another here. It's just something that's a part of our Bible knowledge. And I think for many of us, these words have, they've lost their force. They've lost their power. They've lost that God-breathed inspiration that they had when Jesus first spoke them to his disciples. And they've been assimilated into this Christianese culture that gives them lip service, but really actually lives them out. I mean, if you just think about this statement for a moment, who we are together will tell the world if Jesus is really with us or not. In other words, what Jesus is saying to his disciples, he's saying to them, your testimony alone is insufficient to model me to the world. It's, it's not enough. The message of one Christian will never be enough to represent God to the world. And I'm not saying no one's going to get saved because of what you've shared with them. I'm not saying that, but here's what I am saying. Our God exists in community. He is eternally three persons in one. That's who he is. And so one person can never adequately represent that. We're called to be people who are together in community. We're called to be in love relationships with one another. If we're ever going to adequately represent God to this world, they need to see it in community. That's how Jesus did it. He came in community with the Father and the Spirit. They were in perfect unity. He speaks about that all the time. And this, this idea, this thing of Christian community is really the test of the genuineness of our faith. Because our world is not gullible. I don't know if you've realized that in, in your you know, soirees into the world, in your time at uh, school, varsity, in the workplace. And the world is not a gullible place. There are a lot of salespeople out there who are trying to make a pitch to get you to believe their version of the truth. Okay? That's pretty much every magazine you've ever bought ever. Right? Or every article and blog that you've read online. And there's nothing that we as people can't stand more than people who are hypocrites. You say one thing and live another. And so we all know, and our world knows as well, that who we really are is best seen in community. You say who we really are, who you really are is best seen as you live it out amongst others. Because it's only when there are other people around who rub you the wrong way that we get to see what's really underneath. Right? It's only when people frustrate us or they actually, they legitimately just see things differently to us. It's only when people wrong us and offend us that the world really gets to see if we are the same as them or if we're really different. If this community is the same as any other community or if it's actually different. If we're just selling a pitch or adopting a persona. And I think at, at one level, that's one of the reasons we wanted to start this series by speaking about community. Because perhaps more than any other relationship, Christian community carries a vital witness of who we are as God's people to the world. And if we've really been changed, if we've really been affected by Jesus, it should be visible in who we are together. You should be able to see that. 
There should be something different about our community that when people are among us, they could say like they say in the Corinthian church, surely God is among these people. Surely God is here. There is something different. There is something I have never experienced before that I've experienced here because something is different. God is here. But you know, the thing is, as I began to prep this message, and it was an interesting message to prep, I wasn't really sure for quite some time exactly which direction we were going to go. And, and as I began to prep, I realized that even in myself, I was a little bit foggy on exactly what I meant by the term Christian community. Right? What exactly is a Christian community? So I want, I want to do a little, we're going to, this is the participation part, okay? It's going to be real fun, and uh, I want you to join me, and we're going to work out together what Christian community is. Does that sound all right? It's not that scary, I promise. Okay, so those of you who are not intimidated by crowds, if you have a great nugget of insight, love you to just stick up a hand and say, you know, one, what is one of the things that is an essential component to Christian community? So that's what we, that's what we want to get down to. We want to say, what are the things that are critical that Christian community cannot do without? If you've got one of those, yeah, Grant. Meeting together, right? Absolutely. That's important. We're going, to, we're going to see that. James, I see your hand. We're going to get there now, right? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Uh, let's consider how we can stir one another up to love and good works, doing what? Not neglecting to meet together, as some people do, right? But, but encouraging one another, and even all the more, as we see the day approaching. Meeting together is an essential part of what it means to be a Christian community. And as a part of meeting together, we gather and we encourage each other. We spur one another on. We call each other to a similar standard of righteousness, to a similar standard of faithfulness. We encourage one another as life is difficult and as we're battling in the, as, and to follow God and to live out the life that God's given us. We encourage each other. We remind each other that God is with us, that God is faithful, that he, he will uphold us. Yeah. James. Serving one another. Absolutely, right? We're called to, to love one another, to serve each other, to... Um, I, I mean, I've got it, I put it this way here, yeah, I'm going to find this one. We're doing an interesting thing. I'm going to see how much of your answers match up to what I've got in my notes, right? But um, you can see here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Right? We call to, to serve one another, to carry life alongside each other, to minister together, and to uphold one another as we go through. Any, any other thoughts? Yeah, Kate. Forgiveness, right? That's great. We're called to forgive one another. Here we are. I've got this one for you. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love that binds them all together in perfect unity. Yeah, we need to be a forgiving community. Chad, love one another, right? Absolutely, we see it there. We read it earlier, John chapter 13. Rich, represent Christ. Yeah, that's who we call to be. That's who we call to live out. Um, so I, I, I put that as like a, there's a shared belief and devotion to Christ and a, a responsibility to reflect that and to live that out. And God is doing that in us. 2 Corinthians 5 is not in my notes, so you don't need to worry, James. It says we're being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. Where we're being conformed into the image of his son whom he loves. Right? And we're being, in Acts chapter 4, we see that all the believers, they, they shared this devotion to Jesus. He was the focal point of their community. That is, that is the focal point of Christian community. Right? That's the thing we have in common. It's that we all believe in Jesus. We all love Jesus and we all love to serve him. So you can see that Acts chapter 4, James, that is what... That is there, right? They were all together, and they were together in one heart and soul. That's kind of why we sang that song earlier. Did you see that? It embodies some of these ideas, right? And, they were, and there was great power as they gave testament towards the resurrection of Jesus, the focal point of our faith. Yeah, yes. Pray together, absolutely, right? That's part of what we do as a community. I didn't, I didn't put that one in, right? But it's definitely there. You can see it in Acts chapter 2. From 42 to 44, they, they pray together with each other constantly. Any other, any other insights? I, I got a voice. At, yes, Stu and then Derek. Accountability, right? Absolutely. Right? It's super important. 
Super important. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, those of you who are spiritual should restore him or her in a spirit of gentleness. And keep watch over yourselves so that you don't fall into the same trap. But we are called to hold one another accountable to the standard of faithfulness that God sets for us. Right, Derek? Absolutely. Right, that's critical. That was the first one that I had. And for me, it comes out of this. It comes out of this idea that entrance into this community is not based on, there's not a checklist that you need to make sure, you know, that you pass the test. That, and we have a little committee meeting, and we just, everyone gets a veto vote if they like you or not. Right? Entrance into this community is based on one thing, that you have given your life over to Jesus. And, and that moment you are reborn, and that makes you a part of this community, de facto. Right? You get a part of Christian community when you are born into it, when Jesus said you must be born again, John chapter 3. Right? It's, it's there, or 1 Peter chapter 2, you're a chosen race. God has chosen you. He has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. You were once not a people, but now you are a people. You are God's people. Right? We're, and we're all in that together. Okay, I think uh, there's one other that I've got. I'm just, I'm just going to give it to you, otherwise we might get into a wormhole. Right? We're called to be honest and vulnerable to one another. Right? James chapter 5, verse 16 says this. He says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. There, I did have a scripture for prayer. Look at that. Right? So that you may be healed. And the earnest prayer of the righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. But as a people, we're called to, to actually go and say, you know what, I messed up. I fell short. Maybe I even fell short against you. And I hurt you. And I, and I, want, to, I want to say to you, I, I have fallen short of God's standard. And won't you pray with me and trust for God to restore me? That's something that we do together in community. And that's hard. Uh, let's be honest, that's, really, that's quite difficult. Because that's, that's the moment where we go, you know what, guys, we've been doing this thing together, and we've all been pretending that we're doing really well, and that, you know, how's life? No, it's great. How are you? No, great. I mean, I don't, we don't do it so much here, but sometimes you'll go to a church. Hi, how are you, Rolls? The Lord is good. Amen. I don't ask how the Lord was. I know he's good. How are you? Right? But we can do the same thing. No, I'm fine. I'm good. Everything's great. Yeah? Actually, in, in your heart back home, you're really wrestling with this thing, and you feel like you can't even come to church tonight because there's this darkness and this weight on your soul. But sometimes we just pretend like it's not there. So this one is big, being vulnerable before each other, confessing our sins to each other. So that's what Christian community must consist of. Those are the nest, and there's seven things there. Right? I'll, I'll summarize them for you. Let's do that, and then we'll move on. Right? The seven things that, in my opinion, are necessary for Christian community, and you, we can chat, maybe there's some more that need to be on here, but it's something that you're born into, it's not something you choose, it's something that is based on a shared belief in and a devotion to Christ, it's something that is loving, forgiving, and non-judgmental, it's something that is honest and vulnerable, it's a community where there's a mutual accountability to a shared standard of faithfulness to God, it's a community that bears each other's burdens and supports each other, it's a community that encourages one another to faithful living as they spend time together. Right? Those are the things I think are essential for Christian community. The next open question, and I think the last one um, for, for the rest of the message is this. If those are the components that are essential for Christian community, what are the things that are essential for a friendship? Right? Now, I think, this, I think this is much easier. I think the list is much shorter. Anyone want to offer an idea? Yes, Greg. Encouraging and praying for one another. I don't know if that's essential. I think that could be a part of your friendship. I think that would be wonderful if it was a part of your friendship. But I know I have friendships that don't include that. Joel and then Terry and then Dan. Trust. Trust is a good thing. Yeah, I want to trust that, that what I share with you is maybe not going to be spread out. Yeah, I, I, I'd be okay. I'd say that's pretty good. Terry? Honesty. Yeah, honesty is, you, you kind of hope that that would be a part of your friendship, hey? Though I think that might, that might be like a layer up on some of the friendships I have, right? Okay, we're going to go to Dan upstairs. We're going to jump two more, and then I'm going to land it. Dan? 
an investment of time. You know, it's very difficult to have a friendship without spending any time together. It's really hard. And those of you who've had a friendship that, was, that had a lot of time together and someone leaves, you know how difficult it is to maintain that friendship when all you have is a Skype connection once a month. Right? It becomes real difficult. Okay, there were, there were two over here. Tammy. Yeah, right? So that's, that's one of the things. There is a mutual enjoyment of each other's company. So I'm choosing to spend time with you, and you're choosing to spend time with me because we actually both enjoy it. And it's something that, that benefits both of us. Yeah. Any, any? Yeah, Nick. There we go, right? That was my third one. That there is a mutual shared interest of some kind. I think if you have these three things, you have a mutual shared interest, you both enjoy spending time together, and you actually spend time together, you can have a friendship. Now, you can have other things that are part of a friendship, right? Friendship can be much more than that. Everything that we spoke about in Christian community could be a part of your friendship. And that would be a wonderful friendship. It would be really fantastic. And it will deepen and make it more meaningful. But friendship can exist without those things. I've got, I'll give you an example. I've got some guys I play hockey with. Right? We have a great time together. We all play hockey, and we play hockey together twice a week in winter. There's my friendship. Most of our conversations are not very deep. I trust that God gives me opportunities, and with some of them, we have gone deeper. But for some of them, we talk about hockey, we play hockey, and we spend time together playing hockey. But that's our friendship. And if I phone them up and be like, hey, guys, you want to have a bri? They'll be like, sure, let's go have a bri. You know? That's the level of our friendship. But friendship can get deeper. What I want you to notice in this little exercise that we've done is that the three things that we spoke about as necessary for friendship apart from the spending time together, are not necessary for Christian community. You see that? When we spoke about Christian community, we didn't speak about a mutual enjoyment of being together. And we didn't speak about a mutual shared interest, although you could argue that Jesus is that mutual shared interest. Right? But they, they become, they are those, those things that we have in friendship become sort of optional extras when it comes to community and Christian community in particular. And here's why I believe understanding the difference between friendship and community is really important. Right? Because when you replace community with friendship, the world doesn't get to see Jesus. Right? I'll say that again. If you replace community with friendship, the world doesn't get to see Jesus. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 6, verses 32 to 35. He said, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you only do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinful people do the same. In other words, friendship is normal. Friendship is normative. The whole world knows what it means to, be, to have friends. It's a very normal thing. But your life is to be different. And Jesus, you know, in classic Jesus style, decides to lift the, the pain a little bit here. Right? And he says, your call is to love your enemies and to do good and to lend and expect nothing in return. And I promise that your reward will be great in heaven. And you will be sons of the Most High. And, because, and you will be like him, right? Because he is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. Jesus says friendship is a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing, but it's normative. The whole world does friendship. It's one of the most wonderful relationships out there. And Roland's going to speak into friendship next week, and we're going to speak into and look at it, what, what we have in the kingdom with friendship, and it's going to be wonderful. But if you are all friendship and no community, if you only love those who love you back, then you don't look like your Father in heaven. And you won't reflect Jesus to the world. And in the words of Peter, you will probably be ineffective and unproductive in your Christian life. Because you will have missed one of the most important things about being a Christian. That being a Christian inherently involves being a part of a Christian community. That's where God is best reflected. The Christian life has both friendship and community, and they're appropriately balanced together. 
And so I'm going I'm to finish off my message tonight. We're going to draw this thing to a close. And we're going to look at just three things that can really undermine and break and damage community and how we go about dealing with them. And the first thing, the first thing is this, and this is, I think, the number one challenge to all of this, and you might have seen this idea come out in the stuff that we've spoken about already. But here's the thing I have noticed about me, and I think about people in general, right? Even for us as Christians, we kind of love to be selfish. Anyone ever felt that way? It's just me, right? It's much easier to be selfish. And sometimes we can create very well-crafted excuses for our selfishness, but really at the core of it, we're just looking after ourselves. And it, it kind of struck me as I thought about the, the difference between marriage and community, and we're going to speak about marriage later in the series as well. But we all acknowledge that in order for a marriage to endure and to thrive over the long haul, if you're going to be married for 50 years, I guarantee you this, your marriage needs to be undergirded by selfless, sacrificial love. Right? It has to, and we know that. We know that. We know that in marriage, if you cultivate and foster selfishness, you are going to damage and ultimately break your marriage. Because infatuation has a limited shelf life. And then it runs out. It's just the way it is. And we all know that. As Christians, we all know that. But with community, the same thing is true. If we foster and cultivate selfishness in our community, it will ultimately break it. But you see, we think that because there's lots of other people involved in community, that, that if I'm just a little bit selfish, like just over here, then it's going to be okay because there are other people who will not be selfish and, and my selfishness will be overlooked. I mean, no, no one probably has that thought process, but I bet you that's what's going on somewhere in the back of your minds and your hearts. Right? And I know... It, Guys, I say that, it, it applies to me as well. It really does. This is a battle that I think we fight constantly. And, and when enough of us think that way, Christian community begins to break down. We can do this when, and, and one of the reasons I spoke about the difference between friendship and Christian community is because when we begin to prioritize our friendship over our Christian community, it begins to do that. It actually becomes a selfish thing. I want to spend time only with the people that I like spending time with. I don't want to spend time with anyone. Sometimes, sometimes we'll get into a relationship, and relationships are wonderful, and they're beautiful things, and it's a place where God is glorified. But sometimes, suddenly our partner is far more important than the community that we're a part of. And we've seen this in the lives of people where they have withdrawn from community once they've entered into a relationship. And the community suffers. And ultimately, you suffer as well, especially if that relationship doesn't go the distance, and then you come out the other end and your community is gone because you plugged out. Right? And you don't get all the blessings that we spoke about in terms of community. We do this sometimes when we try and squeeze Christian community into our very busy lives instead of building our lives around what it means to be Christians in community. Remember that description of the early church in Acts chapter 2 where it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the scriptures and to breaking of bread together in homes and to prayer. And they met together daily with one another because it was so important that they maintain and establish and work from a strong basis of Christian community. You see, as, as we were talking about this as a 6 p.m. team, one of the things we realized is that Christian community is actually a lot like family. It's a lot like your family. It's something that you get born into. And that's the only way in. We don't get to choose who is a part of our community. We spoke about that earlier. A Christian community is inherently inclusive. And you know what that means? Is it means that there, there are some people in your Christian community you're just going to like more than others. I don't know if you experienced this in your families. I had one sister. I had only one choice. I'd right, like my sister or not. Right? But there are some people that you're going to like more than others. Here's the thing, though. We, we always carry a responsibility to our families, don't we? If something happens to your mom or your dad, your brother or your sister, you do everything you can to drop whatever you're doing and to get there and to be there. I remember a time when my dad had to go into hospital. He got viral meningitis. He, and I, all I know is I walked into my dad and he was having a fit on the floor and I didn't know what was happening. It was one of the scariest moments of my life. But you drop whatever you were doing, nothing else is important anymore, and you pick him up and you put him in a car and you take him to the hospital. Because we know inherently in us, it's encoded in us that family is important. 
It's the same with Christian community. We choose to make sacrifices for them because they're our family. That's the way we live in Christian. We choose to make sacrifices for one another because they're the community that God has plugged us into. And we need to learn to treat our Christian community like our families and to love them like that. It's the first thing that, that can really break community is when we cultivate selfishness in us. The second thing is this, and, and, and this is when we get hurt, we create baggage in us, and then when we live out in community, we begin to take things personally. And we get more and more hurt because we live out of the baggage that we're carrying. Right? And, and this happens to all of us because we've all been hurt by others. We all carry stuff. And, and because of what's happened, let's say, you know, I, as a, in the past I was always bullied and people always made fun of me and I was just totally put down for my whole schooling career. Right? No one ever accepted me. And then I get into a Christian community and someone lightly makes a joke about you know, something that, and, and how I like, stand out. And suddenly for me, it's no longer just a lighthearted joke. Suddenly for me, I'm deeply hurt and I'm offended because actually I've never fitted in. And now I come to this place where I should fit in and all of a sudden, apparently I don't anymore. And that because of the baggage that I'm carrying, the thing that was said suddenly becomes so much bigger than what it was. And there's a hurt that I carry. And we all carry stuff that causes us to misunderstand people, to take things the wrong way, to presume that we know what others are thinking about us. Right? And all the introverts in the room are like, yeah, I've been there. Right? You ever had that moment you come out of a conversation and you, you're going to your car and you're going to drive home and all that you're thinking in your mind is, wow, that person obviously thought I was ridiculous. You know? They obviously hated me. Like, they'll never call me again. We all, all, all of us often will do that. Or, or we, on the other side of the spectrum, we always presume that we be, know better than others. This is my challenge. I have to constantly remind myself, right, that my thoughts aren't glorious and holy and that I don't know better than everyone else, right, to receive wisdom. And it's all of this stuff that we just carry, that we pick up from years of interacting with people, and we bring it into our interactions with others. And then especially when we're feeling vulnerable about something, where we know maybe somewhere deep down things aren't as great as they maybe could have been, and then someone brings something up that kind of relates to that, and suddenly, oh, the defensiveness is right there. Eh? Because, because that's where it hurts. That's where it's vulnerable. There's a principle that a guy called Stuart Lee, a pastor in the UK, spoke about called the hot coffee principle. Right? So if, if after the service tonight you, you come and join us in the Connect Cafe and you get a lovely steaming hot mug of coffee, it'll be wonderful, it'll be strong, it'll be good. I had a half cup this morning, I'm still feeling it, right? I don't do coffee super well. But if you're going to get a cup of coffee, and as you're walking in the Connect Cafe, I come up behind you and I accidentally bump you on the shoulder and your coffee spills out. And it's really hot, so it spills onto your hand, it kind of burns your hand, it's like a real terrible thing, right? And then we get all frustrated. And the, the principle is this. I may have caused the coffee to come out of your cup, but the fact that the coffee was in your cup was you, your own thing. You put the coffee in the cup. You got the coffee. The coffee was hot because you collected it. Does that make sense? Let me, let me unpack that a little bit more for you, right? <laughs> I, can, I can see you're not all entirely with me on this coffee thing. right? The idea is this. If I offend you, the way in which you respond is actually, I've just called the response out of you. But what comes out of you is what is in you. Does that make sense? Right, so if I bump into you and you turn around and scream at me, right, that's not my bad. I'm sorry I bumped into you, but we should be able to move past that. Right? But when someone sins against us, when someone offends us, we can see what's inside us by what comes out. Right? This is... The Lord constantly reminds me in my driving of this. Right? <laughs> you may have similar experiences. Right? But when someone in Cape Town who doesn't know how to drive and somehow bought their driver's license cuts in front of me without using the indicator and causes me to slam on brakes, right? there are things that want to come out of me. And by the Lord's grace, we're, we're decreasing the amount of bad things that come out and increasing the amount of blessing that I'm trying to speak over them because... What, it's what's in you that comes out. And so if you're responding often in anger, or you're responding often in defensiveness or in hurt or in sarcasm, it's not the person's sin that's causing that to come out of you. 
They are just the occasion to allow what's in you to come out. And that's a great opportunity for us to see what, we're, what it is we're actually carrying. And there's something Paul speaks about in Romans chapter 7, which, which I found has been really helpful for me. And it's this idea of trying to separate sin and the sinner. And I want you to bear with me because the passage in which he speaks is, is a little complicated. And this, this is really helpful for us in our interactions with people. This is helpful if we've been sinned against, and it's helpful if we are sinning against someone. And Paul says this, Romans 7 from 15 to 20, he says, I don't always understand what I do. What I want to do, I don't do, but I do what I hate. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. And he's speaking about the Jewish law and the moral law that was given to the Jewish people. And then he says this, he says, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. For I know that good itself doesn't dwell in me, in other words, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good things that I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. And if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who does it, but the sin living in me that does it. There's a lot in there. We, we, I could preach a whole message on those five verses. But I want you to just catch that last idea, right? If I'm doing the things that I don't want to be doing, in other words, if I'm living as a Christian person, I'm seeking to honor God, and there is sin that comes out of my life, it's no longer I who does it, but it's the sin living in me that does it. And if we can get to this place where as a community we realize that actually all of us are on a journey towards righteousness, that actually all of us are not perfect, if we can be honest with each other about the sins that we're struggling with, and the stuff that we're dealing with, if we can stop pretending that we've got everything perfectly together, then we can start to deal with the sin separate from the sinner. And we can start to realize that, you know what, actually I know your heart, and your heart is to honor God and to honor his people and to love me. But in this thing, sin came out, and we can deal with the sin. And then we get to deal with it constructively. The final thing is this. It's, it's dealing with the double standards that sometimes sit in our hearts. Right? And, and this, is where, this is where I want to land. Um, the last thing I want to say, and as I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm going to ask the team to come up on stage. And, um, yeah, you guys can come now. I'll try and not be too long here. But here's what I want to say. Let's just get more concerned about getting ourselves right before God than about fixing someone else. Right? And, and here's a telltale sign. You might be listening to the message tonight. You may have listened to a number of messages in the past. And, and you th- you're thinking in yourself to your mind, you know, you know Mark. Mark would really appreciate this message. It would be a real blessing to him. If he could just learn this principle, that would change my life. Right? We've all done that a little bit. It's a great sign that maybe you need to be thinking less about Mark. I'm not talking to any Mark in particular, right? right? But maybe you need to think less about someone else and more look more about yourself. Maybe you need to start thinking about you. Because it's always easier to try and fix someone else's life. It's always easier to to try and take the speck out of their eye than to take a moment and to stop thinking about them and to to actually ask God honestly for yourself. Say, God, is there something I need to hear? Is is there something, are you actually speaking to me rather than someone else? For a moment, can we forget the glory of being someone else's savior and actually allow ourselves, in ourselves, to hunger and thirst for righteousness in ourselves? To allow God to sort of vigorously test us. Rigorously was the word I was going for. Right? And then when God has rigorously tested us, and once we've endured that and been purified by that, then maybe we can think about someone else. It's kind of where I want to leave tonight's message, and um, I know Rolls is going to pick up next week as he speaks on friendship, and it's going to be really fantastic. But I w- we had a bit of a sense as we were taking time to pray before the, before the meeting tonight, and, and I felt like I want to change the way in which we're going to end the meeting tonight. James, could you dim the lights a little bit for us? Can we hit the worship setting? I want, to, I want to just create a space where there's an opportunity for you to respond as you believe God is leading you. And perhaps it's in one of those three things that we've spoken about 
in terms of breaking community, perhaps that, that you've recognized as I've been speaking, there's a selfishness that really you've been carrying. Perhaps you've, you've seen some of the baggage that you've been carry, carrying around and you've realized that you've spoken out of hurt. Perhaps you want to just give God a moment to actually speak to you and to allow Him to call out righteousness in your life. Perhaps you've been really hurt by Christian community in the past. And there needs to be some kind of reconciliation. There needs to be a letting go of a pain that's been there for way too long. The team is going to continue to play for, I don't know, maybe five minutes, something like that. And I'd love to just encourage you to respond as God is leading you. If you need to take time and you need to just pray before the Lord, and you know there's something in your heart that God needs to deal with, there's a freedom for you to do that tonight. And you, get, you can just do that before the Lord. We're not going to call you out. I'm not going to lead you in prayer. It's something you can do before God by yourself. But also perhaps one of the senses that we had is that there might, there might be some of us who are sitting here and as I've been speaking, we've been speaking about community. God has made you aware of a space and a time where you have hurt or offended someone. Maybe it was intentional, maybe it was unintentional. God did this to me the other night. He said, Brad, I just want you to go and apologize to that person. And I want you to ask for their forgiveness. And, and uh, you know, Glenn and I had a very similar picture as we were praying that there would be some of us here tonight who are going to respond to God in that way. And you just felt God moving in your hearts and you need to get up and, and go to someone you know, and say to them, you know what, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did this. And this is part of being an authentic community. This is the moment where we say, you know what? We're actually going to let down all the screens that say we're perfect. And all, all the pictures that say that we've got it all together. And actually admit to one another that, you know what? I'm a work in progress. God is working on me. And I want to be honest with my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I want to seek reconciliation. I want to be together on this journey for the kingdom of God and for His glory. That's some of the space we felt to respond in tonight. I see Nick is sitting here with, with Rolls, and I think there's a word that maybe you want to bring into that space as well, Nick. Um, just while Brad was preaching, I had a picture of um, people with glass around them. Um, the sense that I got was that it was one-way glass, and that these people could, could see out and see how everyone else is doing, but that no one could see in. Um, and just how people had... Um, not allowed other people in and they hadn't shared where they're really at um, and that's a really lonely place and that's not what community is about that's not yeah. how God wants you to live um, and so I just want to encourage you if you if you feel like you've been living that where people haven't really been able to see in because you haven't let them I really want to encourage you tonight um, to to trust and to speak to someone mm. um, whom you trust um, the pastors are here at the front, um, a good Christian friend of yours maybe that you came with, um, and be vulnerable and allow someone to look in, um, share where you really are at, and trust someone tonight um, to see that, to see the real you, and to yeah. trust that they will accept you for who you are, because mm. Christ does already. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Nick. That's really, that's really great. Christian community is a really wonderful and a beautiful thing. God, we thank you that we get to experience that together. And so for the next five minutes, you're open to respond to God as He leads you. You need to share with someone what's going on. If you need to confess, if you need to ask God for repentance, if you need to just be with the Lord, you've got a few minutes to do that, and then Glenn and Kelly are going to lead us into a time where we celebrate what God has done in us. Thank you, God.